Well, please open your Bibles to Genesis. Genesis chapter one, are you ready? Oh, let's skip it, let's do First John instead. No. It's funny because I, I think, you know, there are a few books in the Bible that you can just guarantee somebody's gonna be upset. Revelation, it's not the way I see it, or you should have done this, Genesis. You know, so be prepared to be disappointed. No, no, that's a bad way to start, Pastor Brian, I'm sorry. Okay, a few weeks ago, what, we finished the book of Acts, and I really enjoyed seeing the beginning of a new creation in the church, in the work of Christ, and bringing fulfillment to God's promises. And then over the last uh, couple of weeks, we tried to, to have that more aerial view of scripture and see the big story. Um, grab one of those books, if there are any left, the, from, uh, what was it, from Eden to, the, to Jerusalem, to the New Jerusalem, great book. Um, so grab one of those, you know, I'm excited to go now back to Genesis. I'm excited to, to go through this book with, with this in mind, with this big story in mind, to see the story of God, to see the greatness of God and how he's loved us. So when I mentioned, another thing that's funny, you know, I, when I mentioned preaching through Genesis to, to some people, it's interesting that the initial responses um, they go right to the question of, well, how old is the earth, Pastor Brian? And someone asked me, are you going to preach it literally? Okay, now that's a pet peeve of mine. I know what they meant. I probably should have just said, yes, yes I am. Um, but instead, I said, well, what do you mean by literal? And they got this horrified look on their face, like I was some kind of liberal or something, and because, okay, the challenge is, the challenge in interpreting scripture, this is why it's a pet peeve of mine, the challenge in interpreting scripture has to do with identifying the kind of literary genre that we're reading. So when we're reading the Psalms and it says that we take shelter under, under the wings of God, what's literal there? Does God have wings, or do we interpret this literally in the sense that we're faithful to the genre of poetry and that this is a metaphor, and God is protecting us and caring for us? So, okay, pet peeve aside. I, again, I should have just said yes, because what he really meant in asking this is, do you see the creation account as historic narrative? Yes. Yes, I do. And that affects how we interpret it. If it's historic narrative, do you believe the days are like our days? But I get um, sensitive to this question of literal because, okay, well, it's, it's, gotten, it's gotten the church into a lot of trouble with especially books like Revelation, which is apocalyptic genre. It's not narrative. We don't we shouldn't read it chronologically. We're Western, we just wanna be chronological and read it in this wooden way, and it's highly symbolic. So okay, no more talk of that. So this is a part of the debate with Genesis. Um, but I'm convinced that its structure tells us that it's to be read as historic narrative. Obviously, you know, the later chapters, but the big debate is what about one through three? Historic narrative. Another challenge with Genesis is that some want to read it as a book of science. And so many of us might hesitate uh, to, to even read it or certainly teach it because, you know, okay, I'm not a physicist. I'm not a molecular biologist. Um, a challenge that that I agree with but don't presume to solve is that the general revelation that general revelation and special revelation, they should agree, right? General revelation, creation. 
what God reveals about himself in what we see in creation and what people study in science, that ought to agree with, that ought to agree with special revelation, with God's word, what he reveals about himself in scripture. God's written word is authoritative. And more precisely, he, he reveals himself to us in it. So these two revelations, these two books, in a sense, of revelation should agree. God's creation, which is intended to reveal or communicate something about God to us, as we read in Psalm 19, it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. It says something about God. So I agree that the interpretation of God's creation, it ought to agree with the interpretation of Scripture. But we, we should also know that these two books of special and general revelation, they're not on the same level of authority. The Bible, special revelation, is our most reliable, most specific revelation of God. It has authority. And so if you're convinced that the creation account is describing 24-hour days while the earth has this appearance of being much older, millions and millions of years older, then where do we go? That's the struggle here. Some would say that, um, some would say that the Hebrew word for day, yom, can refer to this long period of time. Uh, Day can be used in that sense to be a generation or an age. And so maybe the, something, maybe these creation days, they're, maybe they're millions of years old. After all, with the, they say, after all, with the, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. So what's a day? So I appreciate the struggle to make these two books of God agree, but I also wonder if the struggle comes back to asking a very simple question Does it come back to asking, what's your presupposition? Where is your greater assumption or confidence? Do you begin, do you begin, not not the, I don't want to create a false dichotomy, but where do you begin? Do you begin with God, this concept of God, a biblical concept of God, that he can do all things? Or do you begin with well, he's got to act according to the laws of science. And this is not to diminish the study of the laws of nature, but where do you begin? What's your presupposition? That God must conform to the laws of nature or that the laws of nature are really, really, they're only evidence of God's incredible faithfulness in his continued providence because he doesn't just wind up the clock and let it go. He ordains everything that occurs. His hand is, is sovereign over everything that occurs. So what are the laws of nature other than the hand of providence that so consistently, so faithfully acts within his creation? So the question I'm getting at is, ultimately, can God do as he wills? Or is he constrained by the laws of nature? When we read, here's what I think of. When we read something like Joshua 10, that God caused the sun to stand still and the moon to stop, do we, do we think, oh, that's ridiculous. We'd fly off the planet. God can't do, oh, wait a minute. Maybe... I guess God can probably do whatever he wants, and somehow he'll fix that gravity problem. Do we read that, and, and is that, what's our minds? Do we assume that the sun's activity is simply God's consistent, faithful hand of providence that enables us, that enables us to do science, that enables us to study his creation, and that he can do what he wants with his creation while keeping us from flying off the planet. My point in all of this is to say that we should interpret God's word with the bias of God. 
and not necessarily science. If we are to have a precept as a starting point. So I'm not saying it's one or the other. Our starting point, our bias is God. Do your best to reconcile these two revelations of God. But if God, if he stops the sun and you don't know how this works, let your presupposition be God. Is the earth really millions of years old? Or does it just have this appearance because of a catastrophic event? an eruption, eruptions, or a worldwide flood. That's the thinking, and, and what? People will point out Mount St. Helens really taught us a lot, right? In a day, in, an, in this explosion, and then after it all settles, people look at the geology of it and they think, huh, it looks like millions of years old, but we know it only happened in just this short period. Is that part of the answer? Something to consider. Another question to keep in mind is, I don't know, I heard this years ago and, and, and I, may, I thought it was kind of silly, but then the more I think about it, it's like, it, this is true. How, how old was Adam when God formed him from the dust? You've heard this. Did he form him into, we know he didn't form him into a zygote who grew into a little baby and then a boy and eventually a man. No, Adam had the appearance of, of a full grown man. And yet, how old was he? A day? Is God constrained to, cur- to create according to our assumptions of science, or is science subservient to God? There's a part of me that reads the creation account and thinks that it really doesn't matter how old the earth is. And what really matters is that Adam is a historic person. It matters theologically, right? Because Adam is this federal head. He's the representative of all mankind. So when he fell, we all fell. When when he fell, we bear the guilt of his fall. So theologically speaking, there had to be a, a historic, a real person of Adam as this representative because it has an impact on Jesus, who's described as the second Adam. We love the 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 doctrine of justification. We love the fact that we are in Christ and we are, we are counted righteous because of Jesus, right? Because of his obedience. Adam's sin, Jesus' obedience. We're not righteous in ourselves, but we are, Jesus is our federal head. When we have faith in him, we're, we're in Christ instead of in Adam. So there's this great theological significance to Adam being a real person a historic person. So sometimes I just think, I don't really care how old the earth is. What I care about is Adam is a real person. Um, So the historicity of Adam is theologically significant. And yes, okay, I do think the earth is young. But here's, here's another thought. I think I used to I think I used to get really defensive when I'd come across a believer who had an old earth view and I'd get defensive um, because I thought, maybe I wouldn't actually say it, but I think I thought, well, that's not very glorifying to God that it took him so long to create the earth. (laughs) But do we think that way? And, you know, he's much more glorified if it were six 24 hour days instead of millions of years, right? And that's a silly thing to say because what does it really mean that it took him six 24 hour days? That he, that he couldn't have done it in three? He couldn't have done it in a day? He couldn't have just spoke and everything is fully done in an instant? That's not the point, is it? He could have spoken everything into a finished state in a nanosecond, but he chose to do it in a certain way in six days. So I say that to say, let's not miss the point here. If you have an old earth view, I don't think you're accusing God of being less powerful. The point is not how long it took God. The point is God and that he alone is eternal. 
He's the creator. And there's purpose in him creating. And you're a part of it. And so your life has to do with him. And it's an inescapable reality. Okay, so I I suppose we should read God's word. Uh, But before we do, let's pray together. Oh, almighty God, that we are able to gather and worship you is such a great privilege and joy. Thank you for setting aside one day in seven, a day that's different from the rest, a day for us to rest both physically and spiritually, knowing as we've just sung that our ultimate rest is provided for us in Jesus who said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So Lord, with all of the concerns and stresses of this life, all of the situations that seem insurmountable, help us to rest in you, to see that you are God, that you are the one who spoke everything into existence and who holds it all together and that our very hearts beat because of you. Every breath of air is is a result of your grace. And so we give thanks for this life and the ability to to see you and hopefully love you more because of this this, uh, time in your word. So please bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, before you get too comfy in your chairs there with your eyes closed, let's stand for the reading of God's word. I want to keep you awake. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is God's word. You may be seated. We stood for that? Yes, it's God's word. Be thankful for it. I know some of you are thinking, only one verse, Pastor Brian? We're gonna be in Genesis for the rest of our lives. (laughs) Ah, don't worry. It's eventually gonna pick up the pace and you know, I'll probably skip some of those genealogies because I don't wanna pronounce those names. Uh, So, (laughs) the point is, God. But yes, I believe it was six 24-hour days that in a very short period of time, God created the universe by the word of his power, and then also by the word of his power, he fashioned and formed it so that at the end of six regular days, it functioned by his ongoing hand of providence. So quickly, I just want to give three reasons why why I think the text is describing creation in the space of six ordinary days. First, (laughs) words don't take very long. When God says, let there be light, and then we read, and there was light, what's the impression here? Isn't the text describing an incredible authority of God that at his command things happen? Uh, Parent, when you give a command and order or nicely ask one of your children to do something, is it a threat to your authority when they ignore you and delay or say, yeah, 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 hold your horses, I'll get to it tomorrow maybe. Yes, it is. Yes, commands of authority should be immediately obeyed. And that they are says something about the commander. So don't think that this is something, um, when we read this, I think it's there for a purpose. Do Do you think this is something that God wants us to see? That he is so great He creates with a command and there's this immediate response, it happens. So that the creation is described this way certainly gives, it certainly gives the impression of, it doesn't prove anything, but it sure gives the impression of speed. And I don't know what happened during the rest of the 23 hours and 59 minutes, 
but it certainly fits better with a spoken word, that God simply speaks and things happen. Second, the genre of Genesis 1 is historic narrative. And because of this, it's no different than the narrative in the rest of Genesis. I don't pretend to know Hebrew or be a Hebrew scholar, but Hebrew scholars will note that a consistent use of a particular word throughout Genesis 1 and it functions to highlight a pattern of chronology, a chronological sequence. And it's not found in Hebrew poetry or in other genres where you'd interpret it in a figurative way. It's meant to indicate chronology in a historic account. And so we should read Genesis 1 as a historic account. Third, Whenever the word day is used, because we have that other, right, those other interpretations, well, day, it could be age, it could, it's used in these various ways. But when the word day is used in scripture, along with a number, day one, day two, day three, it always refers to a regular day, always. The days of creation, they're described as the first day, the second day, the third day, and so on. Yes, the word day sometimes means age. Yes, to the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. But the description of the days of creation are very specific and they're designated with numbers. And over 200 times in scripture, we have a day associated with a number. And it always, always, always consistently refers to a 24-hour day. Those who don't think that that we should read it this way because, well, this is the days of creation are really unusual, they're unique. We shouldn't make those kind of comparisons, people will argue. But, But it's also significant that these days of creation are described with the phrase morning and evening. And guess what? Whenever morning and evening are used together in scripture, it always, always, always refers to a regular day. Okay, but here's, a, here's another question that you might have. Have you ever noticed that on day one, God creates day and night, and he mentions morning and evening, but then you get down to day four and realize, oh, wow, now, now God creates the sun and the moon? <laughs> How do we have the measurement of a day without the sun? This is why I began by asking you, what's your presupposition? Creation and the, or the laws, and the laws of science or in the beginning, God? Do we need the sun for time? Do we need it for designations of morning and evening, for a day? It's, it's all we know, so we wanna say, we wanna say yes, but What's really needed for these things? What's really needed for a day? What's really needed for time? Is it the sun or is it God? What's your presupposition? Is God constrained to operate according to the laws of nature or do the laws of nature operate according to God's ongoing providence? Can he make the sun stop in the sky? Or is this impossible because God can only operate within the laws of nature? It doesn't mean that we understand how it technically works, but we should understand that God can do all things. And that our scientific understandings of nature are simply us observing what God so consistently and freely chooses to do. It's not a problem for us this is not a pro- this when the sun was put into the sun and the moon and stars that it happened on day four. That's not a problem if we understand that Genesis one is not describing natural processes, but instead it's describing divine supernatural activity. What does Scripture say is the source of light? Is it the sun, or is it God? Bless the Lord, O my soul. Oh, Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment. 
And then we read in Revelation 22 that one day night will be no more. They will need no more light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. And wow, what is that? Is that symbolic or is it literal? I don't know. But what I do know is that we don't need the sun for light or even time because God is the creator and sustainer of life. He does as he pleases. Genesis 1 is about God. And of course there's significance to us and to people throughout history, but, but think of the significance to Israel among these pagan nations who worshiped the sun and the moon and the various parts of creation. There's, you know, there's a, it has to do with us, but wow, there's a context and an application and, and think about the context of Israel among these pagan nations. How would they read this? knowing that the sun is not eternal, that the, sun, that the sun is not God, as their pagan neighbors think. Pagans worship the sun because they, they stopped short and didn't give God the glory that he deserved. They worship the creation instead of the creator, the sun, because it, it's their source of light and warmth and life-sustaining growth of their crops. But is the sun really the source of these things? No, the one true God is. The God of Israel is the source of light. He is light and life, and he tells us that he didn't even put the sun in the, in the sky until day four, so who's your God, right? The sun, really? The moon, the rivers, the animals? Who's your God? Is it materialism, matter, the stuff of creation, your own intellect, science? Genesis tells us about the beginning of the universe and of history. So if we want to understand the world and the meaning of life, who we are and who we hope to be, Genesis is a great place to start, right? the place to start to form our Christian worldview. And Genesis 1-1 tells us that God is eternal. The very first verse tells us that creation is not eternal. There's a beginning. When it began, God was already there and had always been. We, want, we all wanna know you know, this makes me think, this concept of something, someone being eternal, it just makes our minds ache. But, you know, we all wanna know what most little children ask their mommy. Mommy, where, where did I come from? <laughs> and when they hear that they came from mommy, they may ask, well, where did you come from? And then, where did grandma come from? <laughs> and we know that this can go on and on and on and on, right? So speaking of origins, we also know that this is, this is the right question to ask the evolutionists because since science um, rightly understands that matter, the stuff of creation, is not eternal, then we're left with this same never-ending series of asking, well, where did that come from? Okay, and where did that come from? Okay, and where did that come from? And it just goes on and on and on, and eventually, you may actually hear the answer, aliens. <laughs> and if so, you know what to ask, right? Well, where did, that, where did they come from? <laughs> Another answer you may hear is that there, there was this point of singularity that exploded that the Big Bang caused everything. And I don't know, maybe, maybe there was an explosion at the obedience of God's command. 
but the Big Bang in and of itself still doesn't answer the question, does it? Because the question then becomes, well, where did the exploding stuff come from? Or what caused the stuff to explode? Because isn't there this law that says things that stay, things that are at rest stay at rest unless acted upon by an outside force? So what is that outside force? And the inevitable answer will be aliens. <laughs> or sometimes the answer will be nothing, which really leaves, this silly, leaves us in a silly place because in essence they'd be saying, well, nothing existed and then exploded, which caused everything. Now I'm no scientist, <laughs> I'm no philosopher, but I do know when someone's belief system is sheer nonsense. And what's funny is that this person will likely say that you are the one with a blind faith and that it's just too hard for them to believe that Jesus could possibly rise from the dead. But nothing existed, exploded, and created everything. No problem there. In the beginning, God. Have you ever thought about God being eternal, no beginning, no ending, and then your head explodes. <laughs> and yet, yeah, it's too hard for us to comprehend. It's not our experience. We, we're finite, we don't, we don't get that. And yet, when you really think about it, it's the only thing that actually makes sense. Logically, it's the only thing that actually makes sense. For, for anything to exist, this is the only reasonable explanation. There has to be an uncaused cause, because without this, we're left with that same never-ending question and an absurd faith that stubbornly refuses to believe in God. And with a similar logic, we should also know, we should also know that, oh, beauty that we see, design that is everywhere, it must come from a source with these attributes. Art comes from an artist, design from an intelligent designer. So, oh, the, the heavens declare the glory of God and that people deny the obvious source of creation. It is why Paul began the book of Romans as he did saying, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. And if we ask, well, when did God reveal, when did he show himself to, to every person? Paul answers and he says, ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. And the point Paul makes is that every person, every person is obligated to give God the glory because we read in Romans 11 that for from him and through him and to him are all things. Therefore, to him be glory forever. Man's biggest problem is it's forgetting, it's ignoring, or it's purposefully suppressing the glory of God with nonsense statements that deny who he is and who we are in relationship to him. He is our creator. And we exist, we continue to exist because he upholds and sustains our life and all that is. And with this in mind, we intrinsically know that we exist for him. We exist for him, that we owe him everything, and that he must be the ultimate answer to this longing that we have for something better, for satisfaction. The Bible's very first verse tells us that there is a single being who did not have a beginning, and he is God. In the beginning, God already was. 
And the author of the book of Genesis, Moses, encountered God who spoke to him from a burning bush. And when Moses asked God for his name, he said, I am who I am, Yahweh. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And the meaning of God's name is that he is self-existent. He's not dependent on any, anything else for his own existence. He's the creator. He's the sustainer of all that exists. He is immutable. That is, he does not mutate. He cannot change in his perfection, in his, in his being, in his character. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is eternal in his existence. And so Moses could so beautifully write Psalm 90 before the mountains were brought forth. Or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Oh, the Bible begins with the most important truth of all. Everything good, every blessing flows from this and every problem and every struggle in life, it comes back to this. God is eternal and God is the creator. In the beginning, God. This tells us that there was a beginning to everything, everything but God. It tells us that there are ultimately, there are ultimately two categories, creator and creation. Only two categories, creator and creation. Creation has a beginning and the creator does not. Creation comes from the creator and the creator is I am, the self-existent one. Concerning this, Peter Jones writes, Genesis 1-1 begins with the majestic declaration of difference. Delivered into a world mytholo mythology that affirmed only sameness. That's what paganism is. Sameness. Oneness. This declaration affirms the radical uniqueness and primacy of the creator. It establishes the indissoluble distinction between the creator and what he has freely made out of generosity and love. This distinction between the creator and his creation is really the main difference between Christian thinking and, and New Age thinking, which is just a rehash of ancient paganism. To be, you know, to be one with God, it, it sounds so positive, doesn't it? To be one with God sounds so nice because we like the sound of oneness and unity, but the unity that we're to have is with each other as the bride of Christ. We're not one with God. We're reconciled to God through Christ who is one with God. All throughout scripture we see the importance of this distinction between the creator and his creation. In Isaiah, God is described as the creator of the ends of the earth. Psalm 33 restates the opening of Genesis. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made for he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. Nehemiah says, you alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. This distinction between God and his creation is so relevant to us because we tend to put ourselves on the throne, don't we? When we suffer, when we get frustrated, we sometimes act as though God exists to serve us and, and that he needs, to, he needs to give us an answer for not doing things like we like. It's so silly. It's a little ant, like We see this in Job. 
And the answer given to him is this reminder that he is not the creator, right? God says, where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Where were you, Job? And this goes on for two chapters making it clear that there's a difference between the creator and his creature. And then Job finally answers, behold, I am small, of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. In other words, I'm sorry, and I'm gonna shut my mouth now. God is the creator. This is relevant to us in our lives. It's the difference between Christianity and paganism. And it also answers the wrong criticisms of skeptics who say, who say that the Bible's creation story is, you know, it's just another ancient Near Eastern religious myth, this creation story in Genesis. Contrasting the Genesis account with the Babylonian creation myth one scholar, one critical scholar wrote, what distinguishes the Genesis account of creation among the many creation stories of the ancient Near East is that for Genesis, there can be only one creator. And that all else that is or can be, so this is unlike all, the, all these other ancient Near Eastern myths of their creation story, this is where Genesis is different. All else that is or can be can never be anything but a creature. The Genesis creation account is unique. It tells us that God is eternal, that, that as creator, he is distinct from his creation and as those who bear his image and amazingly are, are loved by him, it's awesome to consider this, th these words from physicist Stephen Hawking, who wrote that our galaxy, it's an average sized spiral galaxy, and it is over 100,000 light years across, about 600 trillion miles. We know, we now know that our galaxy is only one of some 100,000 million that can be seen using modern telescopes, each galaxy itself containing some 100,000 million stars. And in his commentary on Genesis, Kent Hughes picks up on this and writes, not only that, God created every speck of dust in the 100,000 million galaxies of the universe. He created every atom, the submicroscopic solar systems with their whimsically named quarks and leptons and electrons and neutrinos, all of which have no measurable size. God's creation, oh, it should cause us to stand in awe of his glory and his power and his wisdom and his creativity and his beauty. God's word repeatedly considers his creation, urging us to praise. That should be the response, praise. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their hosts by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one, is missing. And not only is God's creation awe-inspiring and praiseworthy, it's really good news because instead of Eastern religions that teach life is this, this never-ending repeat, this never-ending circle that just goes on and on and on, Genesis tells us that there's this trajectory that God gives us direction and meaning and so and so God has a purpose. There's purpose in his creation. There's intention of relating with us. 
dwelling among us in his creation. The cosmos, the creation of the cosmos is a, is a house for God to dwell among his people. And then that passage I just read from Isaiah, it's all these building terms, right? These foundation and pillars and it's describing a house that he's creating. Dwelling among his creation, there's design, there's order. There's a plan to spread his glory by making mankind in his image, male and female, purposefully designed for each other in marriage and family, being fruitful and multiplying and teaching their children about God and filling his glory throughout the earth, that creation mandate. It's what we're called to do. So regardless of what our culture says, that gender is a social construct, and we, instead of the creator, we, we can determine whether or not we're a man or a woman. And we, instead of our creator, we can, we can make our own definitions of marriage and family. How arrogant. Who are we to take what is so purposeful and redesign it as we think best? God is the creator. And he has a purpose. And he's the only one who can define right and wrong and life and death and male and female and marriage and good and evil. It's his creation. It's his design. So who are we to mess with it? Who are we to ignore or resist his sovereign will? Who are we to think that we know what's best for us? That's why so much of this is done, right? Well, I want this. I think this will be best for me. Do you trust yourself or do you trust the one who made you? He made us for a purpose and we're fools to think that we know better than him or to think that we know a better way or a more pleasurable way or a more rewarding way. Read Romans 1, right? It's not, not only is it to our own benefit to obey him, but how offensive is it to God when his image bearers live in a way that communicates a lie about himself because we are image bearers. When we live in a way that communicates a lie about him and his wisdom and his character and his good design. Keep in mind that the original readers of Genesis lived in a world where idolatry was, was widespread and common. And so Genesis 1 is also intended, it's intended as an assault against false gods and false worship. God is communicating his glory to the nations. He's showing himself as the one true God, defeating false gods, condemning false worship. There's purpose in his story. And the Israelites who were led by Moses, they're, they're walking around in the desert. They're looking up at the millions of stars in the sky that, that God made and placed there. They would have known God's plan. They would have known their place in his story. They would have known that the story began at creation that, and that theirs was a story of redemption. It's what he promised them, what he promises us. Moses wrote Genesis during the time of Israel's exodus from Egypt, so they knew they were living this story of deliverance from bondage, from evil, and that God promised them salvation. Their story had to do with creation, it had to do with man's sin and the misery and enslavement and, and death that it brought. But God's story has hope. It has promise. And they looked forward to a savior, amazingly a part of God's original design, this lamb who was slain even before the foundations of the earth. And isn't God's word so beautiful and perfect that the gospel message of the New Testament would begin with the words that remind us of what we just read in Genesis 1.1? Moses began with the story of creation going on to describe the emergence of sin and God's promise of redemption 
And then centuries later, John tells the story of a new creation and the answer to sin and the fulfillment of God's promise in Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. It reminds us that we are, we are a part of God's story from the very beginning of time, that, that Jesus was already planned as the one who would redeem sinners, that, that even before time, he, he chose to love us. And those whom he foreknew, he also predestined writing your story, calling you by name to Christ, justifying you according to his righteousness. And God's story, God's, oh, it's so certain. In fact, it's already written because God's word says those whom God justified, he also glorified. Future tense. Good is done. So if you're in Christ, the end is, is as good as done. Jesus said it is finished. Let's pray together. Almighty God, when we consider the enormity and beauty and perfection of your creation, it's overwhelming to think, it's overwhelming to think that you know us, that we're not just some blurry face in an ocean of people, but that you, you actually know us by name, that you knit us together. You know the number of hairs on our heads that you know the number of our days, that you care for us and provide for us, that you love us to the point of giving your only son to suffer and die in our place. Lord, how can it be that we would be a part of this great history, your story of love and grace and redemption? Give us a greater understanding, give us a greater appreciation for you as we work our way through this book of Genesis. So we thank you, we praise you for this life, for the gift of, of knowing you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you're able, please stand and let's worship the one who is worthy of our praise.
could rescue me from my failing Who else would offer his only son Who else invites me to call him father Only a holy God Only a holy God Good morning. It's good to be together. Uh, if you can stay and help put things away, that would be appreciated. Feel free to stay and visit. I hope you'll visit. Um, may the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. God bless you. Have a wonderful Lord's Day. Hope to see you next week, Lord willing.